This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Well, this video is dedicated to all the young surgeons who are trying to perform their first antivitrectomy or to learn how to manage a posterior capsular tear. So this is I'll be just reviewing one of the such cases where a case of a posterior capsular tear was managed by a young senior resident and I'll just also take you through the case in providing some commentary on the principles of antivitrectomy and the technique of performing it. Most beginner surgeons are very fearful of uh, dealing with the prolapsed vitreous. So the one skill which is going to save them is to know to perform a good vitrectomy and believe me it's not very difficult and just to get you out of this phobia I have got this case. So we have a young surgeon, she's a senior resident and she's going to perform antivitrectomy and place the lens in the sulcus. So let's dive in. Welcome, I'm Dr. Deepak Meghur and this is a case which is being done by our senior resident and uh, this is a mature cataract in a middle-aged man. The reason for performing small incision cataract surgery in this patient was the other high had a classical posterior polar cataract. There's always a higher chance of having an intraoperative posterior capsular tear in this eye and it may be even present preoperatively as well. Uh, with this high risk in place, the surgeon has decided to perform a, a manual spongent cataract surgery and let's see how things turn out. Now this surgeon, she's performed around 120 fake emulsification procedures till now and uh, so we're expecting her to manage the complication effectively on her own. So let's see how things turn out. So the scleral tunnel is created and it's a relatively large scleral tunnel and uh, it's about 7.5 mm of width. The side ports are made, the capsule is stained and the chamber is entered by using a sharp 2.8 mm keratome through the main incision and then it's extended laterally to fashion the internal lip of the wound. Capsurexis is performed. The rexis is of adequate size. It's about 5.5 mm circular. Things are looking alright. So now is the time to manage the nucleus. Uh, mind you, there's no hydrodissection or hydrodelineation attempted. So she's just going to use uh, two synscukes to just wheel the nucleus out of the eye. So using two synscukes gently, the nucleus is maneuvered out. The control is quite good and the large nucleus is gently wheeled out of the bag. Now it has to be expressed out and the OVD is placed in front and behind the nucleus. To be on the safer side, she's going to enlarge the internal lip a bit on either side and she's going to use the FACO sandwich technique. The Sinskuke is on the top and the VECT is in the bottom. The two instruments are going to sandwich the nucleus. The nucleus is gently pulled out of the eye. But as soon as she does, we can see there is a sort of a ring appearing there. And probably this is the posterior capsule rupture. The visualization is not so clear as of now. She has not yet turned on the coaxial illumination. The microscope which is being used is an old Zeiss Visu 150 with an Omni Glow on. And now the retro illumination is on and we can see that uh, there are a couple of uh, demarcation lines seen, suggestive of a possible posterior capsule tear. It looks more likely a posterior capsule tear. So just pushing some OVD, just thinking about it. For a moment, she thinks she's not sure about it. She's going to gently irrigate and see what happens. And gingerly as she's irrigating, I think she's convinced that uh, there is a vitreous prolapse as well. So she stops the irrigation, goes back and puts him some triamcinone acetate. Mind you, then the triamcinone acetate does not stain the vitreous so well in the presence of an OVD. So that is another challenge to deal with. But I think she's convinced of the presence of a vitreous. So now is the time to perform vitrectomy. The first good thing which is doing now is suturing the main wound. Remember when you're doing the antivitrectomy, the golden principle to follow is to have a closed chamber when you're performing by manual antivitrectomy. So you're going to use the vitrectomy and the irrigation probe through the two side ports. Hence, we don't want any leakage from the main incision. So the idea of suturing the main incision is perfectly fine. 
and time to perform the vitrectomy now she is going to use an the reticare a vitrectomy unit which is venturi based the infusion is uh, from the left hand side the bottle is decreased to begin with the bottle light cap is around say 40 cm now she has asked the settings to be like 5000 cuts per minute and uh, the vacuum is 2000 it's a relatively low vacuum and high cut rate and low infusion infusion is kept around 40 cm she enters the with a cutter probe and initially the bevel is turned down she begins the cutting procedure and we can see that the vitreous is being cut and then aspirated and after some time the bevel is turned sideways first and then anteriorly to cut and remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber as the vitrectomy is being done the one point which i would like all of you to notice is that the probe is not being a mood around it is being held still at one place and then the job is being done once the vitreous in that area is taken care of then the probe moves to the adjacent area and then uh, the cutting is begun now this is how it has to be done we can't use the cutter as a stirrer and keep on rotating it inside the eye it has to be held steady at at one place and once we sure that that region is cleared then we proceed to the adjacent area by doing so we are minimizing the chance of inducing any drag or pull so that the vitreous base does not experience any traction so the first principle to understand here is whenever there is a vitreous in anterior chamber you have to ignore other things like presence of any lens matter or cortex first deal with the prolapsed vitreous then you shift your attention to the cortex because if you attempt cortex aspiration with the vitreous still inside the anterior chamber uh, there is always a risk of uh, pulling and tugging at the vitreous which can induce traction of the vitreous base and there is a higher risk of inducing giant retinal tears so this is probably the first principle one has to follow trying to keep it still as still as possible surgeon now pretty sure that the vitreous is taken care of and now is the time to perform the cortex aspiration before coming out viscoelastic is injected into the eye and now is the time to remove the remaining cortex and then now she is going in with the bimanual ind system to aspirate the cortex the cortex is gently held and stripped out of the bag and then aspirated so this time you can see that the extent of pc tear is quite large the surgeon is being a little bit gingerly uh, trying to pull out the uh, cortex because at this point she is not sure whether this is a cortex or the vitreous so she is a little bit suspicious there so whenever there is a doubt always go back with the cutter and then perform the vitrectomy there is again a risk when you trying to cut the vitreous in the peripheral part of the uh, rexus margin there is always a risk that the rexus can get compromised so that's one point you have to remember So now is the time to put in the lens and uh, she is going to implant the single piece PMM lens because we have a large wound it's okay to place the PMM lens in the sulcus the haptics are very thin and they are not going to induce any irritation to the iris or the ciliary body unlike the single piece hydrophobic lenses so the ovid is placed in front of the anterior capsule and behind the iris so that the ciliary space is created and maintained distal haptic is gently negotiated under it and now is the time to dial the trailing haptic very gently and very carefully it is dialed and now both the haptics are in the sulcus the rexus is a little bit large and i'm not sure whether optic capture is possible with this large rexus she is attracting the iris with the pie hook just to see that the lens is in place Trimsin acetate is injected just to confirm any prolapse vitreous there is none and carefully with the irrigation along the ovid which is in front of the lens is uh, irrigated out the lens looks to be stable uh, diluted pilocarpin is used to bring down the pupil the main incision needs to be sutured which is done under the air bubble the side ports are hydrated intracranial antibiotics are placed and that's it the case is done So for a young surgeon who is doing the vitrectomy maybe for the second or third time this is a well done job all the principles were followed like 
you know, suturing the main wound using the bimanual technique with a closed chamber to perform antivitrectomy. The probe was held in the right orientation. The probe was never moved around aggressively when performing antivitrectomy. And the end point of vitrectomy is also realized pretty well. So the purpose of this video is to emphasize the fact that antivitrectomy technique is not difficult at all. You just need to understand the right principles and follow them. Of course, we need to have the right instrumentation which are functioning. But mind you, it is a quintessential skill which every cataract surgeon should have it. Just get rid of the fovea which you have. And you can see that a very young surgeon with limited experience can perform a reasonably good vitrectomy and she could manage to place a posterior chamber lens. So get rid of the fovea, understand the principles well and then follow it in practice. You'll be fine. So I keep telling that, you know, the vitrectomy unit is actually the cataract surgeon's best friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed. That was it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.